The Ujamaa experience has been unique in Africa. It took place from 1967 to 1984. 20 years after Julius Nyerere's death, today is an opportunity to pay tribute to the first president of the United Republic of Tanzania, a sincere and honest man who tried to implement a different type of development, a solidarity society based on two principles, equality and dignity. Today in Somur, it's an information day on Tanzania. Right from the start of Main Street, information, free coffee testing and handicraft sales. Here you display articles from different third world countries and you sell coffee and tea from Tanzania. Why? Our third world committee sells these products tea and coffee from Tanzania in cooperation with artisans of the world groups in France. We sell these products to get in contact with the public, to spread information about Tanzania and other developing countries. <laughs> If de Serre, you took part in a field trip to Tanzania in 1978. What was the reason? Since the creation of the Third World Committee, we've had for main objective to inform and to make the public aware of the problems of the Third World. We coordinated our action with the National Secretariat. Our commitment to pay 1% of our salary for the third world is part of the movement 1% for a voluntary solidarity acts. The need for concrete action has been felt. The development committees helped us to choose Tanzania to support a development project. With the Association Craftsmen of the World, coffee and tea from Tanzania, information, arts and crafts, and also with Earth Solidarity, with other movements fighting against hunger, we hope for close cooperation. It is the condition of a solid support, first to poor countries, which try developing with their own values in respect of each other. It is with this in mind that some of us took part in field trips to Tanzania. Tanzania, a country twice as large as France, is located just below the equator, along the coast of the Indian Ocean, between Kenya and Uganda in the north, Zambia and Mozambique in the south. The United Republic of Tanzania was born in 1964 from the merger of former Tanganyika, independent since 1961, and the island of Zanzibar, near the coast of former Tanganyika, hence the name of Tanzania. <laughs> there are about 120 tribes, the most important of them, the Sukumas, live near Lake Victoria and represent about 13% of the total population.
Tanzania has seven large animal reserves, the largest being the beautiful Serengeti National Park. In this natural park live the most typical animals of Africa. A paradise of tens of thousands of wild beasts. Zebras, gazelle. It is also the paradise of giraffes, their majestic silhouettes moving away at the slightest sound to finally get lost behind the thorn bushes. With a little luck, a filmmaker could surprise near a pond a pair of lions watching the prey they will hunt at night for. With its 17 million inhabitants in 1980, spread over 940,000 square kilometers, Tanzania had an average density of 18 inhabitants per square kilometer. This population was rural in its bad maturity. It can reach 300 inhabitants per square kilometer around Kilimanjaro and near Victoria Lake, while on the central islands it is sparse with sometimes only two inhabitants per square kilometer. The natural increase in the population is in the order of 2.7% per year, despite mortality that affects one third of children before the age of five. The Tanzanian population has an interesting social homogeneity because none of the 126 ethnic groups represented has a dominant position compared to the others. In addition to the few thousand Europeans living in Tanzania, Two ethnic minorities are now well integrated in the life of the country. First, the Arabs. About 20,000 live on the coast and on the islands, while Asians, Sikhs and Indo-Pakistani, in larger numbers, occupy key positions in the small industry and trade. Tanzania was one of the ten poorest countries in Africa, with a gross national product of about $150 per person per year. Its industrial and commercial capital, Dar es Salaam, has about half a million people. It was also an important harbor for the transport of goods to Zambia, Rwanda and Burundi. One third of Tanzanian workers live in Dar es Salaam because of its various range of industries. The rural exodus to the city, as in all underdeveloped countries, obviously is an important problem. That is why the government decided to transfer the capital to Dodoma, a city of 20,000 inhabitants located in the center of the country. Like everywhere in black Africa, the settlement of the population until 1970 in Tanzania was linked to water availability. Located near water springs or wells, the villages were scattered very unevenly, 
throughout the territory, which made the development of the country very difficult. The traditional dwelling was most often a cylindrical house with a conical roof. Today it is gradually giving way to a great quadrangular dwelling with log frames covered mostly with thatch. The coast of the Indian Ocean had very early been in contact with the outside world. Indians, Phoenicians, Assyrians, Persians and Arabs established trading posts and began to develop trade. In the 16th century, the slave trade developed in Africa. In the 18th century, 15,000 slaves were shipped each year from Zanzibar to Asia. From about 1850, European powers developed the colonization of East Africa. The Berlin Conference was held in 1984, when European states shared Africa like a cake. Tanganyika was attributed to Germany, but after World War I, the German colony went under British administration. Maintained in an economy of self-sufficiency, the population was despised, abandoned and exploited by the colonizer. Tanzania gained independence after a century of German and then English colonization. The Prime Minister was a former teacher, founder of the Nationalist Party, Julius Karambaji Nyerere. He graduated from the University of Edinburgh, was re-elected for the third time in 1975 as President of the United Republic of Tanzania. President Nyerere's fundamental idea, which recurs in all his speeches, is that of dignity, a dignity based on equality, freedom and mutual respect. For Nyerere, freedom means not only liberation from foreign administration, but also relief from hunger, ignorance, disease and inequality. Several agricultural development trials were experimented. First, there were the village settlement schemes. The idea coming from foreign experts was primarily for production. Model villages were equipped with very modern agricultural equipment. But there were 600 people living in these villages, while 10 skilled workers would have been enough to cultivate everything and make everything work. Following this failure, 
President Nyerere wanted to offer a new course to the Tanzanian economy. <laughs> On February the 5th, 1967, in the Arusha Declaration, he invited the Tanzanian people to create a solidarity society based on an African model together with everyone's cooperation. By laying the groundwork for a socialist strategy, the Arusha Declaration encouraged communities to solve their own problems by relying first on their initiative, energy and courage. On February the 6th, 1967, all private investment banks were nationalized and each of the following four days, other measures were taken to take control of the country's economy. The same year, in 1967, President Nyerere directed the socialist experience towards the creation of Ujamaa villages. This Swahili word, Ujamaa, means community spirit or familyhood. Following the model proposed by Julius Nyerere in a Ujamaa village, a number of farmers gathered together freely, cultivate a common field, and share the income of the field according to the work of each individual. Many Ujamaa villages of this type failed. In a bartering economy, it's not easy for people who know how to trade cassava for sugarcane, to be able to participate in the management of a community of 60 to 70 families. On the other hand, other Ujamaha villages have been more successful. They are the villages where all members have a private plot to cultivate and with which to get their means of support and food. In fact, the Ujamaa idea was utopian, but it wasn't dogmatic because it evolved several times over a period of 17 years. As President Nyerere said, the important thing is to try something to defeat hunger. If we succeed, we continue. If we fail, we look for something else. The government was obliged to face up to reality. In the central island of Tanzania, there was a small population, scattered at the rate of two inhabitants per square kilometer. In such a contest, the development was impossible. Needless to think of having schools, dispensaries or running water. In these conditions, the purpose of Uchamaa was to invite villages to join forces. For more than four years, members of the government tried to convince peasants to regroup freely. The results were insufficient, so some regional authorities imposed constraints to group them together. The government changed plans and instituted the development village or cooperative village. In such a village, there is no collective field and the regroup farmers cultivate their own private plot. The advantage of these villages is that farmers may use the equipment belonging to the cooperative. 
At the end of 1975, legislation was defined concerning the organization of development villages. Each village becomes a legal entity that can open a bank account, sell and buy. Each farmer cultivates his own field as he sees fit. So private property is preserved, but can sell or buy only through the village cooperative. The village is administered by the village assembly and the village council is made up of elected members. Living in the village, how is it lived in real terms, Bernard Joinet? Well, it is concretely lived in villages. The population was regrouped in 1974 in development villages. These villages have their own government. They try, they have a secretary. They have a president elected by the party. They have a development committee of 25 members who are elected by all the members. The village forms a unit. The farmers build their school walls. The government gives them the steel sheets. They have their own market. And automatically, for example, 10 cents per kg of corn or 15 per cents per kg of cotton come back to the village. This means that the more villagers produce, the more they have personal profit. And also, more money comes back into the village cash register. You feel that I am a defender of a Jujama, but in reality, it's not a piece of cake. You understand? Share with others? Who wants to share? It's not that easy. And then, instead of making your own little plans, chat with the others, consult the others, listen to the others, it's not easy. Twelve years after the Arusha Declaration, Tanzania was neither socialist nor self-sufficient. The country couldn't hope in the short term for a great economic development. In Nyerere's mind, what counts above all is the gradual improvement of the standard of living for all, with dignity, more than the absolute improvement of national production. To achieve the purpose of self-reliance, that is to say, to develop the country by counting on its own strengths, the unique party, CCM, has set up a number of structures. CCM is a mass part. The duty or the objectives of this mass party is the development of Tanzanians economically, politically, and culturally. For our ideology centers on men, for CCM is the development of man. In order to meet the needs of the country, using its own resources, the government created in 1973 the SIDO, the Small Industries Development Organization, to develop small industries in the villages. Since the creation of the SIDO, Imports of small manufactured goods have declined significantly, saving significant amounts of foreign exchange. On the other hand, 
exports are now in the form of processed products, which also improves the trade balance. The managers of this mechanical workshop were very proud to explain to us that a few years ago, the engine crankshafts were sent for repair to Great Britain. Today, the mechanical parts are repaired or machined in this workshop, giving us a greater autonomy. Similarly, these high temperature refractory bricks for locomotives are manufactured today in Tanzania. A clever heating technique has been developed by a Dutch aid worker which involves burning waste oil with water to provide the necessary energy for cooking. Generally, women work a lot in Africa. Here in Tanzania, the government gives them an important place. On several occasions, we met women responsible for economic and social activities. Tanzania set itself the task of satisfying the usual needs of its people and educating them by preserving African values. In Dar es Salaam, in this craft shop, 50 artists and craftsmen contribute through their works to the discovery of a modern expression of African art while retaining the inspiration of their ancestors. In traditional Makonde society, sculpture had a dual function, both in religion and community. Today in Yumbaya Sama, some Tanzanian craftsmen are turning to the design of modern items, but without altering either the charm or values of traditional African society. Certainly, democracy wasn't perfect and poverty was the share of the majority of the inhabitants. Nevertheless, the country has taken some steps to achieve self-reliance. The most important step, in President Yerere's point of view, is having reduced some inequalities between citizens and bringing a little more dignity to men and women in Tanzania. In 1972, a guideline was defined, Siaza Nikilimo, that means politics is agriculture. Food production has increased, and millet reserves have increased significantly in recent years. Between 1967 and 1977, the government subsidized the price of fertilizers and granted credits for cooperatives. The Tanzanian government aimed to provide three main things a primary school in every village, a dispensary to improve hygiene and health, 
and finally drinking water for domestic needs. In 1974, Tanzania was able to educate only half of school-age children. The best students in primary school are encouraged to stay two more years at school to become a young teacher. Kwa sababu hiyo, mungu wa majeshi, awa penda kupita ote. In most primary schools, children work one or two days a week in a common field under the supervision of agricultural instructors. The harvest is supposed to represent one meal a day. Moreover, many schools provide bricks, carpentry or various works. These self-sufficiency activities were still limited, but they were gradually accepted as part of the education system. The second objective of rural development, having a clinic in each village, was still far from being reached because only a few hundred villages were equipped with a dispensary. The government focused on rural areas. Possibilities were however very limited since they could afford to spend only one euro per year per person, which is very little compared to France, which spent a hundred times more. The third development plan placed greater emphasis on preventive medicine in the training of nurses and medical auxiliaries as well as in the popularization of vaccinations against tuberculosis, measles and polioid. In 1979, infant mortality was still very important. It is 14% for children under one year, 10 times more than in France. The Tanzanian government, being aware that the number of doctors alone will not improve the level of health, a major education and hygiene campaign was launched in 1973. A year later, in 1974, a second phase was launched to go further. Shakula ni uai, that is to say, food is life. To eliminate a caloric and protein deficiency of a part of the population, efforts were made to educate people so that they eat more cereals and that they produce and consume vegetables, eggs and poultry. On the other end, national campaigns were carried out to popularize the construction of latrines or pits of these in each village. Although important efforts were made in the domains of hygiene, health and nutrition, the situation was far from good, even though infant mortality was decreasing and life expectancy was 47 years, whereas it was only 40 years at the time of the independence. The third objective of rural development was the supply of drinking water. The battle wasn't won because only 3 million people in villages had access to drinking water, which means that 10 million people didn't have it. Mm -hmm. 
Tanzania had not yet reached the stage of economic takeoff because in order to buy machinery and equipment goods it had to increase the volume of its exports particularly by increasing the production of commercial crops and food crops Significant efforts needed to be made to improve farming methods thus in this field Millet grown in poor conditions could not be harvested. Furthermore, only 7% of the land was cultivated, and cereal yields were low, 920 kg per hectare against an African average of 970 kg per hectare. In 1977, 10 years after the Arusha Declaration, President Nyerere acknowledged that the results in agriculture had been disappointing. People in villages often dream of buying a tractor instead of learning how to train oxen to pull ploughs. In cities, they try to buy a truck, whereas they could buy many more small carts. In some places, there is a tendency to fell trees or break branches for usual needs. This deforestation progressively leads to soil erosion and transform fertile valleys into dry areas. I personally think that the Ujamaa experience has been useful for African countries and it is up to them now to make their agricultural revolution by achieving especially the combination of agriculture and breeding. As Professor René Dumont, a great expert in tropical agronomy, said, the essential basis of an agricultural revolution are the supply of organic manure, the realization of anti-erosion devices, the use of early ripening varieties, and the combination of agriculture and breeding. Unfortunately, in Tanzania, there was not enough emphasis on these four conditions. However, as President Nyerere said, peasants worked hard, but they worked without the knowledge and sufficient understanding of agricultural improvements. But what set the Ujamaa experience apart is that it had tried other things. On the industrial side, the expansion was small compared to the needs of Tanzania, but it is explained by the very low level of industrialization at the time of independence. One of the priorities for Tanzania has been to increase the development of companies enhancing the value of raw materials produced in the country. For example, in 1964, very little cotton was processed in the country, while today Tanzania has nine textile factories producing about 80 million square meters of fabric, which ensures the country's self-sufficiency in this field. Although low, the overall value of industrial production has tripled in 10 years and industry accounts for about 10%
of national income instead of 8% in 1966. Provided through courses at the end of working days, adult education is also broadcast through songs. To improve people's living standards and conditions, increasing agricultural production is a necessary requirement. But why? Would the farmer produce more if he doesn't obtain a greater profit and doesn't find on the spot enough goods to satisfy his needs for common consumer goods, bicycles, clothing, household conveniences? Like most third world countries, the chances of economic success remain conditioned by the problem of energy. Hydrocarbon research yielded no results, so the country relies heavily on its oil imports. Fortunately, the potential available in electricity and coal is expected to help Tanzania set up a basic industrial sector. The increase in the cost of oil has not been the only cause of economic hardship. Thus, during the first 10 years of independence, Tanzania suffered a significant loss in purchasing power due to the collapse of the price of sisal, which is used to make ropes and bags. Can Tanzania quickly reach the economic takeoff stage? Mr. Omari Isa? Well, I, I'm not sure I can pinpoint a year or a decade in which Tanzania can reach that status. I think it all depends on uh, how the developed countries accept to introduce the new economic order, new international economic order, which Mwalimu has been speaking about for a long time at many international forums. Basically, it means taxing the rich countries for the benefit of the poor countries. Uh, what we have now really is we sell our crops to the rich countries, they decide the price, then we buy the manufactured goods from the rich countries. They also determine the prices. As long as this situation continues, I don't think we'll ever get to an economy which would be in our favor. So the sooner we introduce the international economic order, the sooner Tanzania will be able uh, to arrive at that goal. Thank you. The aim of the Ujama experience was to create a society of solidarity by bringing about a change in mentalities in order to achieve a gradual improvement of living conditions for all. The motto of the country, Uhuru Nakazi, that is, independence and work, has become Uhuru Ni Kazi, independence is work. Vijana Tanzania, now Tanzania. Vijana Tanzania, now Tanzania. Sisi tu kumbele kujenga taifa. Sisi tu kumbele kujenga taifa. Kujama na kisomo tutaendeleza. 
However, as Julius Nehrer said, there were still many problems to solve and many mistakes to correct. Ambao katika sehemu yao kuna kikundi cha kisocialisti na ambacho kina moyo cha kusaidia watu wa ulimwengu wa tatu. Unfortunately, the economic results have been insufficient. From 1984, Julius Nyerere recognized that it was necessary to change course. The economy has progressively been liberalized and the means of production might be transferred to the private sector. In 1985, being somewhat lucid, Julius Nyerere decided not to stand again in the next presidential elections. This was then the end of the Ujama experience, which had raised a lot of hope. <laughs> The Ujamaa experience has shown that poor countries cannot reach the stage of economic takeoff without the help of developed countries. The necessary agricultural revolution in Africa must be carried out by African agricultural instructors with the help of foreign aid workers. It must be based primarily on the association of agriculture and breeding. According to a UN recommendation, developed countries should spend 0.7% of their gross domestic product on aid to poor countries, as they pledged to do in the 1960s. To that effect, France would have to increase its official development aid because it is only 0.5% today. Only a few northern European countries achieve this UN recommendation. Moreover, individuals who can do so are invited to pay 1% of their income for other countries looking forward to development. This probably is the best way to limit immigration and allow the development of poor countries. The country had set itself the goal of creating a modern society, avoiding all the disadvantages of a society copied on developed countries. In 1971, Julius Nyerere declared, We would like to light a torch at the top of Kilimanjaro a torch that would shine beyond our borders and give hope where there is despair, love where there is hate, and dignity where there is only humiliation. Bye -bye.